been a couple of weeks since Red Bull announced Daniel Ricciardo's departure from VCarb and it's kind of started to feel a little bit like the F1 community is going through the seven stages of grief. From the shock of how the narrative took a sudden turn after qualifying for the Singapore Grand Prix on Saturday night, to a bit of denial because the whole thing just seemed a little bit bizarre, to the outpouring of anger both from a huge number of those directly involved in the F1 community and those looking in from the outside. A lot of people were flat out just enraged by how everything went down. Now it feels like we've reached the bargaining stage. Folks coming out of the woodwork saying, well actually Ricardo wasn't that great anyway. The revisionist history approach. Because the way he was dropped, well it turns out it was all fine, actually. But why are so many people hung up on this one driver getting fired mid-season? It's the third time it's happened in the last two, after all. What's the big deal? Why does Daniel's dumping get such an outpouring of emotion? Countless clickbait headlines with sound bites from people who are desperate to make themselves relevant again, and multiple career retrospectives right here on YouTube. Where is all that for Nick DeVries or Logan Sargent? Well, really, it's all about impact. Hi, my name's Kimmy, and I talk about F1 in the world's second worst accent. And I can't help but scratch my head when I see people complain about the visceral reaction to Daniel Ricciardo's firing was so much more extreme than that of, say, Nick DeVries or Logan Sargent. That's just comparing apples with, I don't know, Kraft Cider or something. One's been plucked fresh off the tree and chewed up and spat out already. The other's matured over time and has a bit more kick and a cult following. Daniel Ricciardo's impact on the world of Formula One and its global visibility can't be overstated. And look, I'm not saying he's as big as Lewis. Nobody is as much of a household name as that guy. Even my mum knows who Lewis is and she has no idea about anything to do with Formula One. There's no way she knows who Daniel Ricciardo is. So I'll make it clear, I'm not saying Daniel Ricciardo has a bigger impact than, say, Lewis Hamilton. But while he might not be a household name like Lewis, Daniel Ricciardo brought a lot of new fans into the sport through one choice line. I'm Daniel Ricciardo, and I'm a car mechanic. Drive to Survive made a number of people huge stars by showing us their personalities, their struggles, their depressing backstories on a scale that we'd never seen before. Gunther Steiner, Toto Wolf, Charles Leclerc. Even when people didn't participate in the Netflix circus, it got everyone talking. But undoubtedly, the main protagonist of that first series, and to a point subsequent ones, was Daniel Ricciardo. He had everything F1 needed to be their perfect poster boy. He was young, attractive, funny, fast, and in 2018, his story was that of one of being at a crossroads. The investment people had in Daniel's ongoing journey meant that many of them made the transition from being fans of a TV sports reality series to fans of the sport itself. That journey now, well, it's likely at an end. But many of those fans have broadened their horizons. They've become fans of other drivers and teams and they're probably going to be sticking around for a really long time. But Daniel Ricciardo's impact isn't just that of being a media show pony, ready to be wheeled out whenever the cameras need someone to show them a big smile or give them a really choice soundbite. Speak to anyone who knows F1, anyone who watched his first stint in the Red Bull teams, and most of them will say that Daniel was one of the top three drivers on the grid between 2014 and 2020. Many will even say he was the best during that mid-period of Mercedes domination, and that the only reason he never won a world championship is because he was never in the right place at the right time. And a few might say none of those things. And honestly, it's probably because they're haters, or they started watching F1 a year ago and learnt everything from a couple of articles written during the McLaren era. They're now experts on the subject. Every one of Daniel Ricciardo's wins was an event. They were never simple, clear-cut, qualify on pole and drive away with the race. In his whole career, Daniel Ricciardo only ever qualified on pole three times. And the one time he won from it, his NGUK packed up 20-something laps into the race and he had to spend the next 50 defending like hell from Sebastian Vettel for arguably 
one of the greatest, most satisfying wins in Formula One history. Daniel Ricciardo's talent was never wringing the most out of a car during qualifying. It was his ability to make progress through the field during the race, his ability to read the braking zone of a corner, and of course, his ability to make the car as wide as possible when he needed to keep people behind him. And I think that's one of the reasons why I'm so sad we lost Daniel this year. This sounds like I'm giving a f eulogy. I and I think that's one of the reasons why I'm sad about how everything went down this year with Daniel Ricciardo. I think that's why I'm sad he never got another chance next to Max in a Red Bull. Not that it would have been the right time or the right place once again. Fernando Alonso, Mark II. And I don't want this video to be about stats and analysis, right? But Daniel Ricciardo's performance over the last year or so was actually pretty solid. He was often hampered by bad strategy, bad luck, and a bad car. But you'll have to take my word for that for now. Maybe at the end of the year we'll do a deep dive into it. I don't know. Like, let me know whether or not you want me to do that. I'm sure somebody would have done it by then, so it'll probably be redundant, but comment if you want me to go over every single minute detail of why I don't think Daniel Ricciardo's last season or so was really all that bad. But the reality is that Daniel has had some of the most compelling victories in the sport, and all bar one of those have come from a position other than pole. And I'm not denying that a good competitive qualifying session isn't a hell of an exciting thing to watch, but seeing a driver climb from sixth to first through brave, well-measured, and considered overtakes rather than pit strategy will always trump an exciting qualifying session in my book. And unfortunately, Daniel's famous overtaking ability was probably, in the end, his downfall. He relied on it. He relied on the fact that he knew he could make up positions in the race through sheer driving ability, until he couldn't. He never really got the hang of overtaking through the dirty air of this new generation of ground effect cars. And he never figured out how to refine his qualifying into something more consistent like what we saw last year in Mexico or this year in Miami. Among the racing stats, the overtakes, the memorable quotes, there will always be reminders of Daniel Ricciardo's inherent goodness. The way people from inside the paddock constantly talk about his kindness and his thoughtfulness. The way fans tell stories of him waiting in the lobby of a hotel while they go back up to their room for a pen, or going against his PR team to stay behind and sign things and take selfies for long after a showrun event's finished. Daniel Ricciardo's legacy in F1 will be that of a bit of an enigma, even though, at the time, we often felt like his heart was worn on his sleeve. Beneath the smile and the laughter and the good vibes, there'll always be a lingering melancholy, a feeling his story never really ended, and that there's still another chapter waiting to be written. And you know what? I might be delusional, but I choose to believe that there still might be. Thanks so much for watching to the end of this video. If you enjoyed it, please consider clicking the subscribe button and make sure that you turn on the bell notifications so YouTube lets you know when I post a new video. Please also click the like button. You know why? Because that tells YouTube that, hey, this video might actually be good and then it shows it to other people and that helps out my channel. And while you're here, here's another video that might catch your fancy. Maybe, I don't know. It's been recommended by YouTube's algorithm. Which is great for watchers, but not so much for creators, let's be honest. Okay, thanks, bye.